So grab your Bibles, turn to Mark 12, Mark 12, and um, if you need a translator for my accent, we can get a translator up here, someone who speaks American, I only speak English, I'm learning American, I moved over here 16 years ago and I found out you guys have a lot of different words and different ways of doing things, I found out the hard way, I could tell you stories, but some of them are not PG, so I won't, but there is a lot of words in England, let me tell you, that mean different things in America. So I'm just, I've got myself embarrassed a few times. I'll tell one. I mean, Kent, if, you, if you get complaint, you know, if you, if you don't like it, complain to Kent Ward, praise the Lord, and, and uh, Overcomers Church International if you're watching on, online. But uh, my first ever Bible lesson I taught, I, I was teaching leadership, and I'm there and I wrote, on, and I, I talked about never assume. I said, never assume. I was talking about points of leadership. I said, never assume. I said, if you assume, I wrote it on the whiteboard. Assume, A-S-S-U-M-E. I said, if you, the people who are getting it, I said, if you assume without knowing the facts, it makes a donkey out of you and me. But in England, we just say that word. It's not a semi-cuss word. And I saw everyone at Bible school going like, oh. <laughs> so I thought, they're really getting this point. This is really good. I'm going to drive this point home. And I said, that's right. It'll make a donkey. But I didn't say that. And they were like, so then they came to Carly and they said, does your husband always cuss when he teaches? <laughs> And let me tell you, that was the, that was the, like, the least uh, embarrassing mistake I made. I made a lot of embarrassing mistakes. But I'm blessed to be here. Carly and I are blessed to be here. We're actually American citizens now. It cost us tens of thousands of dollars and my dignity. They do medicals on you. Do you know that? How many of you had to take a medical to be a citizen? You didn't, did you? I had to take medicals to be a citizen. And, um, and anyway, it, was, uh, it cost us tens of thousands of dollars. It cost my dignity. But it was the best deal I ever made, praise the Lord, to be a, to be a, a citizen of America. Praise the Lord. So we're blessed to be here. We're from the second best country in the world, England. But uh, we're very happy to be here in America. If my English friends are watching online. I love you very much. <laughs> praise the Lord. Come on over and join the party. Turns out our American cousins have got it going on pretty well. So okay. This is Mark. I'm going to start uh, preaching the word before I get into too much trouble. Mark 12. Let's jump in at verse 41. This is a very interesting story you may have heard of. Um, and it's Jesus right here teaching in Mark 12, verse 41. It says, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. And so he's in the temple watching people giving the offering. This is very interesting. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. He was watching people give. <laughs> like, we're meant to... I mean, like, don't look, you know, if someone's writing a check. I know you're tempted if someone's writing a check next to you. Have a look there, see what they're giving there. But we're not meant to do that, right? We're meant to be very, you know, prim and proper and everything else. And the bucket comes around, you know, don't look and see if people put anything in the bucket. In fact, I was a Boy Scout growing up. And you have Boy Scouts here? Like, yeah. So I was a Boy Scout when growing up. I didn't grow up as a, a Christian. I got born again at 16. But I was a Boy Scout, so I used to go to church once a week for the Boy Scouts. And we used to go to different churches in our parish. So they would bring the bucket, the offering round, and I'd have different tricks for getting away with the offering because I didn't want to give the church my hard-earned money. I'm like, you know, I worked hard delivering newspapers or washing cars with this money. I'm not giving it to no church. So some churches would come around, there'd be a bucket. Well, let me give you some tips. The bucket's easy, right? You just put your hand right in like that, and it looks like you're giving. Sometimes you can tap the bottom of it if you want because in England they give coins. They just give coins, right? So you can tap the bottom of it. It sounds like you're giving the bucket. Then they have the plates, okay? The plate's a little harder, but if the plate comes around, it's already got coins on it, you can just flick the plate pretty hard like that, and it makes a ching noise. It looks like you've given, okay? And then another thing you could do is you can put a breath mint in the bucket. That sounds like coins. Also, I've done the pouch. You know, have you seen the pouch? It looks like a sporn. The pouch comes around. As that comes past, just give it a little nudge with your knee as you do that. Make the, make the changes. I could give you 101 ways of getting out of giving. This is going to be a great message. Pastor's going to love this. How to get away with giving. Another trick is just get a blank envelope. You don't do anything with it. Just oh, yeah, seal that up and put that in there. Look, I'm giving, I'm giving. <laughs> I didn't understand about giving, as you could tell. And I, got, I used to not want to give. But can you imagine if Jesus was here watching? Well, I got new to Jesus still watches how we give. He did it here. He changes not. I'm the Lord your God. I changed not. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Jesus watched how they gave here, it means Jesus is still watching how we give. In fact, me and Carly preached at one church, and um, uh, your pastors know this church, but we preached at one church, and the pastor does actually stand on the stage when people are giving, and they have literally like 20 offering buckets. I'm exaggerating. They have 20 different offering buckets for missions, for different countries, for different, all different types of things. And people come along and they give money in, these, in all these different buckets. I mean, it's hard work going to this church because they have like so many different buckets. And they're giving. And, and one time the pastor's up there and someone puts money in one of the buckets, I think it was from Mexico Missions. And the pastor went, hey, Bob, 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 come on. He goes, you can do better than that. And he went, oh, okay. Come back. <laughs> come on with the 
pastor told him, you can do better than that, come on. So that's quite extreme. But <laughs> Jesus watches how we give. And it says here, many who were rich, we're in Mark 12, 41. This going to be a fun morning. Many who were rich put in much. So the businessmen, the people that are rich, they come and put in much. And it says in verse 42, then one poor widow came and threw in two mites. She threw in two mites. I tell people today, sometimes we give two mite offerings. We might give, we might not. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like we're type of indecisive about our giving. We think people say, well, I'm just led by the Spirit. No, we need to have a plan about our giving. We're going to share some of this. But I might give, I might not. No, she gave two mites. And these two mites were worth probably around 2 or $3 in today's spending power. So in today's spending, it's probably 2 or $3 worth of money she gave in. It was her last two mites that she had. It was her last bit of money she had. That's all she had. This widow came and gave all she had. That was it. And verse 43, it says, So he called his disciples to himself. So imagine this. He's watching people give, and the rich people are giving, and people are giving, and then this widow comes and puts in two mites, and he says, hang on a minute. He calls his disciples, boys, come here. Pull up a chair. I've got a, I, we've got a lesson here to be learned. He, said, he called his disciples, teaching moment. He said, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all these who have given into the treasury. Jesus says, this poor widow has put in more than all the rich people put into this treasury. Now, let me ask you a question. She didn't actually give in more monetary, did she? She gave in two mites, and it says that the rich people gave in um, much. They put in much. So money-wise, if we're talking about the dollar amounts, she did not put in anywhere near what these rich people put in. But he said she put in more than all these rich people have put into the treasury. Verse 44, and he explains it. For they all put out of their abundance. Nothing wrong with that. You have an abundance, it's good to give out of your abundance. You have an abundance, you have $10,000, you give $100, that's given out of your abundance. But he said right here, he said, they all put out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. And here's the thing, Jesus didn't call her back and say, hey, miss, 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 you're poor, you're a widow, these two mites are all your livelihood. Don't, don't, you don't need to give. Take it back. You, don't, you shouldn't be giving. Jesus didn't call her back. He let her give. Because Jesus knew the most important thing for her to do with that last two mites was to give into the offering. We could, we could talk about other widow women in 2 Kings 4. We could talk about 2 Kings um, 17, I think. The widow woman came and made Elijah a cake first. So make me a meal first before you die. We could, we could talk about different things like this. Now, we like this story sometimes. I've heard people say, Brother Ashley, Brother Ashley, it doesn't matter about how much we give. See, the widow woman, she just gave two mites. So I can just give $2 and it'd be okay. And these people are wealthy people. Just, it doesn't matter about the mites. And I said, we focus on the two mites. But really, the point of the story was all she had. It's not the two mites. It's all she had. She gave all she had. She gave mightily. She gave out of, out of all she had. She gave with all her might, you could say. You know, it's a great story. I won't have time to go there, so I'll just uh, reference it. But there's a great story in First Chronicles, verse 29, verse, uh, First Chronicles 29, when David's going to build the temple. Have you know, you're in a building project now, so this is a good, good illustration. But David was going to build the temple, and in First Chronicles 29, he said, I'm going to give, I've given with all my might. I've prepared with all my might. David actually said, I've prepared with all my might. Like, he, he actually worked on this. Like, I'm going to give a good offering. I can't build the temple myself. The Lord's told me, even though it's in my heart, it's for my son to build. How many know God is a generational God? Three generations. You read through the Bible, he's a generational God. We think in 80 years spans, we think in a short timeline. God thinks in hundreds of years, he's a generational God. So some of your words that you have may not be necessary for you to fulfill. It may be for you to prepare for your children or your children's children to for fulfill. So right here, he said, you know, David said, you know, in 1 Chronicles 29, I'm going to prepare an offering. I'm going to prepare. He said, I'm going to prepare with all my might. So David prepares with all his might, and he gave, gives a bunch. You can see it listed there in First Chronicles 29. He gives a bunch of money. In fact, in today's spending power, they estimate this to be anywhere from 500 million up to 20 billion with a B. Billion. 20 billion with a B. I like the billion thing. Was it? Anyway, 20, it's a big number. 20 billion. So up to... But, Conservative, they say, a billion-dollar offering. He gave a billion-dollar offering. He gave all his gold and silver and, and wood and all this fine stuff to the building of the temple. He said, I've prepared of all my might. Why? Because his heart was with God. 
You know, uh, Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And, and David loved God so much, he wanted to worship and honor God with all his substance. So he gave a big offering. Then he turned to all his men, he turned to his mighty men and says, what do you all want to give? Do you want to give? Are you going to match that? What are you going to do? And his mighty men turned around and they also gave a massive offering, anywhere from 500 million to a billion dollars. They gave a massive offering as well, almost matched David's offering. And remember, these mighty men were the same mighty men that earlier you can read about that came to him that were all the outcasts. These mighty men were the outcasts. They were the ones that were indebted, that were distressed, that were like the, the, the outlaws, you know, the outcasts. They were not wealthy businessmen, but they hung around David long enough to get themselves wealthy, to get themselves prosperous, and they were able to give a bunch of money to the treasury. So David gave all his might. So you could say here we have two people in the Bible that gave all their might. David prepared all his might, and the widow woman prepared all her might. One gave two mites, which is like a couple of dollars. One gave like a billion dollars. But yet in God's eyes, they both gave with all their might. They all gave with all their might. So what does this tell us? We'll turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's look at chapter 9 first. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, if you didn't know, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and chapters 9 are all financial verses. The Apostle Paul actually wrote this all about finances, about offerings. He talks about how he was supplied by his partners and all things like that. So these, these two chapters, chapters 8 and chapters 9 of 2 Corinthians, are all about money. And I tell people, if you take a text out of context, what are you left with? You take the text out of context, you're left with a con. So don't take the text out of context. One of the things they criticized me about was like, Ashley teaches out of 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and chapters 9, that's talking about being spiritually rich. Well, you can apply that to being spiritually rich, but I've got news for you. That word rich means substance. It means monetary wealth. You can study it out. The same, uh, very similar word they use in the Hebrew um, is also translated in the Greek, but the Hebrew word is a very similar word in, um, uh, I believe it's Proverbs 10, 22. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he has no sorrow to it. That same word, rich, means monetary riches, not just spiritual riches. So this in context is talking about money. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, let's jump in here. Let's jump in here. So let's jump in verse 6, I guess. Verse 6 says, This I say to you, this is 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, verse 6. This I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giving. I always say, at Territus Ministries, and I'll say this for your pastor as well, we don't mind if you're cheerful or sad, if, as long as you give, we don't mind. <laughs> you want to give to the building project, if you're grumpy, it's okay, we'll still take your money. <laughs> God, the reason why God loves a cheerful giver is God loves it when people understand the power of giving. And they give, and in fact, that word cheerful means hilarious, it comes from the word hilarious, which is where we get the word hilarious from. You can also, if you study this out, it also means crazy giving, like illogical giving. Giving to the point that it makes you laugh, whether you're nervous or whether you think it's funny, <laughs> but it makes you laugh. So this is talking about generous giving. It says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully or generously, one translation, I think it's the King James, says generously will also reap generously. And I said, you know what? King David gave generously. He prepared with all his might. He got all that gold together, all that silver together. He's like, I'm preparing to give to the Lord's house with all my might. And he gave generously. But also the widow woman gave generously. Because Jesus said she gave generously. He, she, he pulled, her, uh, pulled the disciples aside and said, look, see that woman walking out? She gave generously, even though she only gave two mites. So how do we know when we're giving generously? We need to understand this. This is important, church. Because God has set it up so fair. God's an, God's an equal opportunist. He gives the same opportunities to anyone. He says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord. Um, Acts 2.21. That means it doesn't matter who you are, whosoever. How old you are, how young you are, how educated you are, how uneducated you are, where you grew up. doesn't matter. God says, whosoever will call on the name of Jesus shall be saved, shall be sozoed, meaning not just salvation, going to heaven, eternal life, but also have a relationship with Jesus, have righteousness, have peace, have healing, and have prosperity. That's what that word sozo means. You're going to get it all when you call on the name of the Lord. So God's an equal opportunist. In fact, they say many are called, but few are chosen. And some people say, well, God only chooses some. No, God chose everybody to have a relationship with him. God paved the way for every single one of us to have a relationship with him, and not just a relationship with him, but a prosperous relationship with him. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. 
John 10.10, Jesus came to give us life. He died so that we could have life, praise God. He rose again to enforce his will, and we have life in Jesus. So anybody can turn to Jesus and experience the abundant life. Our television program is called the Abundant Life Television Program. Anyone seen that Abundant Life television program? A few people, okay. You should watch it. It costs us thousands of dollars to air. That's a bit, it's an expensive deal, television. Do you know that? Television is expensive. The, the cameras, the equipment, and then the airtime. Like these companies, they do, bless them. I shouldn't say that, but anyway. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to go on television. I was like, how much? How much is that by a minute? Oh, no, that's a lot by a minute. But anyway, so we're on television all around the world. We, sit, we have great testimonies. Thank you, partners of Terridez Ministries, for making it possible for us to have airtime on television. And um, we're on some of the biggest, the, the biggest Christian network, Daystar, and also TBN and, and Gospel Truth TV, Faith TV, a bunch of other ones. Thank you for getting the airtime out there. But my point being, we called our program Abundant Life because Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. He wants you to live in the promises of God. All the promises of God are in him, yes and amen. He wants you. He's provided. How bad would it be if someone went to great lengths to provide for you a great present and you didn't even open it? You didn't even accept it? That's dishonoring. That's type of really sad. Isn't it? Can you imagine that? Jesus went to great lengths for you to receive these promises. See, we have a promise that God wants you to experience the abundant life. In every area. That means eternal life means relationship with him, but it also means healing of your body. You saw some of those testimonies. They were just from the last two weeks. Healing of your body. Oh, no. I guess two months. But anyway, recent testimonies. We have other ones. We can go back. We've seen people healed 15 years of Parkinson's disease, completely healed, like instantly. Metal rods completely dissolving, and now they can touch their toes and things like that. We've seen, we've seen miracles because it's God's power flowing through. When the word's preached, signs follow. So... God has set it up so that you can receive that. You can receive healing in your body. You can receive peace of mind. How many of you know right now at the moment, more than ever, we need mental health. We need peace in our mind. And it doesn't come through drugs. It doesn't come through counseling. Those things can help sometimes. But ultimately, you need the peace of Jesus in your mind so that you can have that supernatural peace. Jesus paid for you to have peace. Jesus paid for you to have righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Why? So that us might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's the same with healing. First uh, Peter 2.24, by his stripes you were healed. He, he took stripes on his back so that you could be healed. It's the same with finances, with prosperity. He became poor so that you might be made rich. And some people get really offended at this. Actually, you can't teach people that God wants them rich. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. I'm not teaching it. It's what the Bible teaches it. In fact, I was in Africa, and they said, um, the pastor said, we've got a problem. We have some protesters. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Like cars upside down, fire, there's some placards, there's going to be all some tear gas, this is going to be great. But it wasn't that impressive, it was like a few people on Facebook, that was it. So it was a bit of a letdown. But he said, these people are, uh, are really upset because they, they're telling me, don't bring this American prosperity gospel teacher to your church. So I thought, well, this would be fun. So I get up to preach on the Sunday morning, and I start preaching, and you can hear him whispering like, he's not American. I was like, no, I live in America, but I've got an English accent. And English do not talk about money. It's very funny. So God chose an English man to talk about money in America. But anyway, so that type of room I've got, they're like, he's English. What do you do with that? And then the first statement I said, I said, I just want to correct something today. I said, the prosperity gospel is a lie. There's no such thing as the prosperity gospel. And the pastor was like, he was about to pull me, you know, pull me off the stage. I was like, there is only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, don't preach another gospel. There is no such other thing. Now, here's the deal. When the gospel's preached correctly, that gospel includes your righteousness, your healing, and your prosperity. The gospel includes your prosperity. Why? Because Jesus paid for it. 2 Corinthians, I'll say it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. A financial verse. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that us through his poverty might be made rich. Just like he became sin on the cross. Jesus never sinned, but he became sin on the cross. God made him and you know sin to be sin for us. Why? So that we could take his righteousness. He took your sin and shame and punishment, and we got his righteousness. That's a good deal. He took your anxiety when he sweated drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. He took your anxiety so you could take his peace of mind. It's a great deal. He took stripes on his back, pain in his body, so you can take his health and healing and wholeness. He took your poverty, your lack your lack of finances to the cross became poor and you took his prosperity and riches. Although he was rich, people say, well, yeah, actually, Jesus was rich in heaven. No, he was rich on earth. People get really upset about this. He was rich on earth. 
He had money. When Jesus was a toddler, wise men turned up with a bunch of gold. They had so much gold and wealth that King Herod was concerned about them. Big entourage turned up, gave him a bunch of gold. He had money. He traveled. You couldn't travel without money in them days. He had 12 teenage boys. Have you tried feeding 12 teenage boys? It costs money. You fed four. You know, that's like 12 teenage boys. That costs money. He drove a brand new vehicle, an unridden colt. <laughs> he had... People say, Ashley, you, you know, he had such nice clothes that they didn't, they didn't want to rip them. They, they fought over his clothes because there, there was a special garment that had no seam. Special nice clothes. He traveled. He had his own house. People say, you, know, you can read the scriptures. It said he had his headquarters in Capernaum. He said to Levi, come and follow me to my house. They, they said, follow me to the house. It was his house. It was the house they broke the roof through and, and lowered, the, lowered the disabled guy through. That was his house. It was his headquarters in Capernaum. They said, well, Ashley, Jesus, he didn't even have money to, to pay for his own grave you know he had to borrow a tomb he was so poor he had to borrow a tomb I tell people I don't think that was because he didn't have the money to buy a tomb I just think it was good stewardship because if you think about it if you're only going to use a tomb for three days why buy it (laughs) let's have a bad investment and you can't get like Airbnb tombs I mean you can't get you can't rent a tomb who rents tombs so he just borrowed a tomb no here's the truth church when Jesus died on the cross he became poor. But when he was on earth, he had money. When he died on the... See, here's the problem. We have a conflict because we want to be just like Jesus. But religion has told us Jesus is wandering around like one up from a homeless man in rags. I had someone come up to the other day. He said, Ashley, Brother Ashley, he said, Jesus didn't own a car. And I was like, he, said, he didn't have a car. He walked. He never had no car. And I was like, that really isn't worth explaining. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Jesus was, did not, was not poor on earth. He became poor on the cross. Just like he didn't sin, he became sin on the cross. Just like he wasn't sick, he became sickness on the cross. He wasn't poor on earth. He became poor on the cross. And what happened was when he died on that cross, he took your poverty and my poverty to the cross. They did a, they did a, a world research. What's the worst type of poverty a person can experience? They said the worst type of poverty a human being can experience is being naked and thirsty. Well, how did Jesus die on the cross for you and me, naked and thirsty? He took that poverty to the cross, and now it's our right to receive that prosperity. And has the prosperity message been abused? Of course it has. You ever seen a bad marriage? Does that mean we give up on marriage? No. People abuse these things. People don't understand these things. People reject this message or abuse this message. I'm telling you, this message needs to be taught in a correct way. If you don't understand the purpose of something, you're going to reject it or neglect it or abuse it. That's what happens. I heard a story once about this lady who bought her elderly father an iPad when they first came out. So when they first came out, she bought him an iPad, sent it ahead, and then a couple of months later, she went to visit him. And she thought, you know, it'd be good. He could, like, FaceTime and read and stuff on it. So he went to visit him. Said, she said, Dad, she said, Dad, she said, how did you like my birthday present I sent you a few months ago? He said, oh, I love it. Thank you so much. He said, I use it every day. She went, really? He said, yeah. And he was in the kitchen chopping carrots on it. <laughs> Put it in the dishwasher. Never even turned it on. $500 chopping board. He didn't know what it was. He, he didn't know the purpose of it. So because he didn't know the purpose of it, he abused it. If you don't understand the purpose of prosperity, you'll abuse it. I'm going to tell you what the purpose of you being wealthy is. The purpose of God. God has given you the power to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18. Deuteronomy 8.18. In fact, two of my favorite verses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8.18 and Deuteronomy 28.8. Great verses. Deuteronomy 28.8 says, He commands a blessing on your storehouses and all to which you put your hand as you swore to your fathers in the land that he's given you this day. I mean, my first book came out. Andrew Womack stood up at a conference and he held my book up and he said, I won't do his accent. I'll spare us all. But he makes fun of my accent. I'm like, really, Andrew? I'm like, anyway, in his strong Texan accent, he said, this is Ash's new book. And there was like 2,000 people in this conference. He said, this is Ash's new book. And he says he'll sign every copy. And I was like, oh, I was like, and he looked at me like smug, and I was like, thanks, Andrew. I was like, so for the next three hours, I was signing books. But I've never signed a book before. I didn't know what I was doing. So people gave me the book, and I just like, I was a bit nervous. I just signed my name and gave it back to him. And I could see over the course of time, people were a little disappointed. So I asked someone, I said, sir, I said, you look a little disappointed there. Like, what's up? He said, well, I don't understand. No, I said, tell me, I need to know. I've got like another 200 people to sign books for. What's the problem? He said, well, He's always got to tell you, he goes, usually when people sign books, they put like something in there, you know, like blessings or, you know, a word or something, or maybe a Bible verse. I said, they do, do they? He said, yeah, maybe they put a Bible verse, Philippians 4.19, you know, something like that. I said, okay, I can do that, no problem. So the next person came, and I thought, well, I like Deuteronomy 8.18. Do not forget the Lord your God, for it's he who's given you the power to get wealth. But also, also like Deuteronomy 28.8. 
He's commanded a blessing on your storehouses and all to which you put your hand. So I was like, Deuteronomy 8, 18, or Deuteronomy 28, 8. Well, I was a little nervous, so I put, started writing Deuteronomy 28, 18. Now, don't look up Deuteronomy 28, 18. That means you're cursed with a curse, and the fruit of your womb is cursed. <laughs> is cursed. I, started writing, I started writing that in the books. Deuteronomy 28, 18. Be blessed, brother. Deuteronomy 28, 18. Can you imagine? He gets home. Honey, I've just come back from Brother Ashley's conference. Get the kids. He's wrote a word for our family to stand on. Get the kids. <laughs> Little Johnny, get the Bible. Okay, read this. Ready? Deuteronomy 28, 28 18. You are cursed. <laughs> cursed. But anyway, Deuteronomy 8, 18 is where I'm at. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, Do not forget the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the power to get wealth. Did you know God has given you the power to get wealth? You have the power to get wealth. God does not give us money. Money does not rain from heaven. If you're in your prayer closet praying for money, that's a wrong prayer. Start thanking God that he's your provider. Start thanking God that he's given you the power to get wealth. He's given you the power. Everything you put your hand to prospers. You put your hand to something, you receive wealth. But you have to do this and understand that it's your, your promise you can stand on. If you don't understand this, giving makes no sense. If you don't understand that God's empowered you to get wealth, why would you give? You're giving and you're going to run out of money. No, God wants you to prosper so that you can give see that see god says jesus says um, or paul says that jesus became poor so that we might be made rich second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 but if we we need to understand the purpose of prosperity we need to understand the purpose of why god wants us rich and that's in one chapter over we just have to go over to second corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 is where we are at the moment second corinthians 9 it says here let each one purp- give as he purposes in his heart not grudging of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver verse 8 I said all that to go to the next verse. Verse 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, And God is able. God is able. God is able means that it's not just going to happen automatically. As we respond to God's grace, God is able to make all grace. This is a grace thing, church. This is something that's a free gift. This is something that's been paid for. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Ready for this? That you always having all sufficiency in all things. I don't know about you, I want all sufficiency in all things. That means all your needs met all the time. In your personal finances, in your business, in your ministry, in your church, all your needs met all the time. That's a great place to be. Never having lack. Your mortgage paid on time, your rent paid on time, your, everything, always. All your needs met all the time is a beautiful promise right there. And God is able to do that for us. He's able to make all grace abound towards you. That you have an all-sufficiency in all things. Now, if it just stopped there, you know, I actually had people challenge me and they say, Ashley, I don't believe in all that believing God for an abundance thing. I don't believe in that. I said, that's fine. You can just stay poor. And they say, no, no, I, I, I just really... I, first of all, I say to them, you're going to have a problem with heaven because there's an abundance in heaven. There's an abundance in heaven. They have the streets paved with gold. I mean, heaven is an abundant place. So you're going to have a problem. With, if you've got a problem with abundance, you're going to have a problem with heaven. But he says to me, no, no, brother, Ashley, I just want to have enough for me just to pay my bills just look after my kids, and that's it. I don't want to believe God for more. And, I said, and he said, I think it's selfish believing God for more. I said, actually, in fact, I said, I think you're the selfish one. I said it with a smile. You know, when you've got an English accent and you smile, you can get away with a lot. It's amazing. It's like, it's like that's why all the criminals, no, what's that? It's all the baddies in the movies are English. The villains are, uh, the villains are always English. But I said, I said, I think you're the selfish one. And he said, excuse me? I said, why would you not want to believe God for more? Have you not read this verse? What does it say here? You have an all-sufficiency in all things, but it doesn't stop there. If it stopped there, it would be selfish. It would just be about us. In actual fact, if it stopped there, it would be okay because God loves you. God's your father, and he loves to provide for his children. Did you know that God actually goes by his own word? Like, God doesn't have his word, and then he operates outside of his word. He's bound by his word. So he actually provides for his kids. He's actually a good father. He provides for his kids. But look what it says right here. It says that you may have an abundance. The, this is the end of the verse. May have an abundance for every good work. King James Version says, may abound to every good work. The purpose of prosperity is so we can have an abundance for every good work. Again, Deuteronomy 8.18. I didn't finish the verse. Deuteronomy 8.18. I get distracted with my own teaching. Kai said, you went on a rabbit hole, like a rabbit trail, and then another rabbit trail, and it's hard to get back sometimes. But Deuteronomy 8, 18, I didn't finish the verse. Why does he give you the power to get wealth? So to establish his covenant. He gives you the power to get wealth to establish his covenant. He gives you prosperity right here so that you may have an abundance for every good work. That means not only your needs being met, you can give to projects. You can give to 
the, the building fund. You can give to, to single parents. You can give to ministries. You can give to feeding programs. You can give to sponsored children programs. You can give wherever there's a need. Your neighbor has a need, you give to them. I could tell you so many stories about we've seen people come to the Lord or listen to the gospel because we've given. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And one way you can show people you care is by providing their needs and giving to them. Now, that's not always the solution. You know, we have panhandlers in Colorado, and I did an experiment. I was like, I'm going to, every time I see a panhandler, I'm going to try and help them. And it was, a, it was a fruitless task, I'm just going to tell you. Because everyone, I mean, I found one genuine one of about, I don't know how much I talked to, probably 20. Like, I need gas. I said, brother, no problem. Where's your vehicle? Oh, over there. I said, okay, pull up behind me. I'll fill your tank up with gas. Oh, no, no, I just want $5. No, no, I'm going to fill your tank up and pay for it. Where's your vehicle? Let's fill your car. No, 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 I don't want you to do that. Just give me $5. I'm like, no, no, I'm going to fill it. No, so hungry. Kids and I are hungry. Come on, let's go. See that restaurant there? I'm gonna, it's going to take you all to eat. Let's go. No, no, just give me $20. No, no, I'm going to take you to eat. Whatever you want. Nice restaurant. Let's go. No, 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 just give me the money. So anyway, I tried that. One guy, I said, he said, I need money. I said, come back to my place. I said, I've got a bunch of acreage. You can, you can rake the leaves. You know, I'll give you a day's work, and I'll pay you 100 bucks for a day's work. No, no, he said, I can't do that. I said, I'm going to pay you 100 bucks for a day's work. Come on. He said, no, no. He said, I haven't got the uh, work permit for Colorado. He goes, I'm from the state. <laughs> Fit young man. I'm like, I haven't got a work permit. Anyway, so I tough and gave up. I gave up with that. But my point being is, is that that's not always the case. You don't just always give money. But... There is plenty of need around. Just in ministry alone, there's plenty of need. There's plenty of things. You know, one of the biggest restricting factors in our ministry, and I know it's the same in the church, is, is resources. The more money we have, the more gospel we can get out, the more people we can help. It costs money to, to have churches. It costs money to buy buildings and heat them and, and cool them. It costs money to fly around the world. You know, I mean, Kylie do about, I don't know, 100 airplanes a, a year. We can't just go up to United Airlines and give them a hug. They want money. It costs money to write. We have staff. We have a bunch of staff back in Colorado. We have a bunch of staff in, in South Africa. We have an office in South Africa. We have to pay those staff. And those staff want paying every two weeks. It's amazing. <laughs> two weeks later, they want paying again. doesn't matter how much comes into the ministry. We still pay them the same amount. It costs money to run ministries. It costs money to run churches. It costs money to preach the gospel. It costs money to help people and to show people how much you care. If the good Samaritan didn't have money, if he wasn't a wealthy man, he wouldn't have been in the Bible. The good Samaritan had his own vehicle, he took the person, you know, to the, to the inn and swiped his Amex and said, whatever he spends, I'll pay for. If he, you know, no problem. He had money to do that. We can help more people with money. So money's a tool to help more people, praise God. But the, but the purpose is God has given you this, the power to get wealth. And what happens is God gives us transactional favor. God will give you, yeah, just come to go with this. God will give you transactional favor, which means that in your workplace, in your business, in your investments, Whatever you do day to day, whatever you put your hand to, you are blessed. God's commanded a blessing on the works of your hands. So whatever you put your hand to is blessed. That's diligence. You be diligent in them areas. But what happens is, is God's transactional blessing comes about when we allow it. God's not going to go against your free will. And some people say, well, actually, I'm just going to, if God wants me to prosper, I'll just prosper. Well, we could say that about anything. If God just wants you saved, he'll save you. Well, God wants everybody saved. God wants a relationship with everybody. But only those that choose him get to spend eternity with him. Well, if God wants me healed, he would heal me. No, God wants you healed. He's paid a terrible price for you to be healed in your body 100%. But it's our choice to receive healing. We still have to receive it. Grace has provided it. Faith is our part to receive it. So we have to do our part to receive it. And people say, well, actually, if God wanted me prosperous, I'd just be prosperous. No, we have to put our hands to something. We have to activate that. And one of the things we do, we put our hands to something. But the other thing we do is we give. You know, Proverbs 11, 24 says there's one who withholds more than is right, and it leads to poverty. But it starts off with there's one who gives, or there's one who scatters, there's one who gives liberally, and it leads to an abundance. They have more. It doesn't make any sense to our natural mind. But I'm telling you, church, the power of God doesn't make sense to our natural mind. The promises of God don't, if you think about it. If you think about it, the, the kingdom of God is opposite to the world's way of doing things. You know, I moved here... 16 years ago, and I found out, like I said earlier, that you do a lot of things different than they do in England. I love America, but there's some things you do differently. Like I came out of a gas station in Colorado Springs, and it was a three-lane divided highway. There's no one around, so I just came out of the gas station. People are like, they're already knowing where this is going. I drove out of the gas station, just driving down the three-lane divided highway, just driving along, praising the Lord, minding my own business. I look up, and there's three cars coming head-on towards me. 
I thought, what are these three idiots doing on the wrong side of the road? I thought, this is terrible. It's me. I was on the wrong, I was going down a, a divided three lane highway the wrong way. Did a quick U-turn. They told me I was number one at the next stoplight. They said I was number one. I was like, thank you for that. But, but <laughs> even now, it's weird because all my life I've grown up driving one side of the road and you have to learn how to drive on the other side of the road. And, and it's weird. Like even now, just recently I, I, I pumped gas. I got back in, I was on my own. I opened the passenger door, got back in, shut the door, looked up, no steering wheel. And I'm a little paranoid. I'm thinking people think like, what's that idiot doing? So I had to like play it cool. I'm like, I'm cool, I'm cool. I opened the glove box, looking around, and I was like, the owner's manual. I was looking for the owner's manual. That's what I was doing. Get back out, go back in the other side, sit down, off I go. Because all my life, I've got used to sitting on one side of the car. All my life, I've got used to driving on one side of the road. I came over to England, and I came over to America, and I had to learn to drive on the other side of the road. Even now, when I go back to England or Australia, we go to Australia, England, uh, South Africa, it's weird because it's, like, it's confusing. So most of the time, I just don't drive. I'm like, let someone else drive because it's just dangerous. Okay? <laughs> but, but have you know, if I said, you know what, bless God, all my life I've driven on this side of the road, I, I'm more comfortable on well, this side of the road. Yeah, well, someone drive me back to my hotel. It's going to be dangerous. <laughs> this side of the road. I don't want to drive on the other side of the road. It feels weird. It feels weird sitting this side of the car. I don't like it. I'm going to carry on sitting in this side of the car. I can just hold the steering wheel over here and driving on the wrong side of the road because that's what I'm comfortable with. That's what I'm used to. How many of you know that would not work, right? I'd be in a wreck or in prison or something. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good. But here's the thing. I changed address. I went from the kingdom of, 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 uh, I went from the kingdom of England, the Great Britain, Royal Britannia, to... United States of America. So I changed address. And when you change address, you have to actually do things according to that country. I say it works. I can't get out my British pounds and try and buy something. They won't have it here. You have to use dollars. You have to get with the system. I can't speak the words I used to speak in England. I was, people get offended. You have to get with the system. How do you know, when you got born again, you changed address. Colossians 1.13 says he took you from the kingdom of darkness... Colossians 1.13, and put you in the kingdom of the son of his dear love. When you got born again, you changed the dress, spiritually speaking. And I can prove this to you. That's why you're seated with him in heavenly places. That's why 1 Corinthians 6 says you're one spirit of the Lord. That's why we don't know when your spirit ends and God's spirit you know, starts. You know, 1 John 4.17, you are just like he is. As he is, so are you in this world. You're one spirit of the Lord. So you are now seated with him in heavenly places. They call us, you know, the Apostle Paul says, we're ambassadors here on earth. We don't belong here on earth anymore. We belong to heaven. We live off of heaven's economy. We live off of heaven's way of doing things. And the kingdom way of doing things, heaven's way of doing things, are usually opposite to the world's way of doing things. They don't make any sense to our logical mind. That's why it takes faith. Let me give you an example. If you want to be first, the kingdom of God says you've got to be last. You want to be the greatest leader? The kingdom of God says you've got to be the greatest servant. Someone wrongs you? The kingdom of God says forgive them. Someone steals your tunic. I don't even know what a tunic is. But they steal your tunic. Give them your cloak also. If someone, if, if, if you need wisdom, you speak in Babel. You speak in tongues, you get wisdom. This is all opposite to the world's way of, of doing things. This is opposite. If you want to get ahead financially, if you want to prosper financially, you have to give money away. It doesn't make sense to our natural mind, but it's the kingdom of God. It's the power of God, and it takes faith to do it. And when you do it, it's amazing what happens. God has set it up this way. And people say, well, actually, I give, you know, how comes I, I don't see this manifest? How comes I don't see this abundance God's promised me manifest? Well, God gives us seed to sow. He doesn't give us the harvest. He gives us the seed. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we can keep reading. Sorry, chapter 9, we can keep reading here. It said, we was in verse 8, right? This is the longest uh, passage of scripture I've ever read. But anyway, verse 9 says, He has dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, he's righteous and Jewish forever. Verse 10, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower. God supplies seed to the sower. God supplies us with the seed. And he doesn't supply seed to the people who think about sowing. He doesn't supply seed to the, the singers. He I love the singing. Praise the Lord. It's awesome. And that is a great part of worship. But he supplies seed to sowers and bread for food. And he supplies and multiplies the seed you have sown and, the, and increases the fruits of your righteousness. Now... This means that when you have finances, God is supplying you with seed. He's not supplying you with harvest. It's up to you by faith whether you're going to sow that seed or not. If I had an apple up here, I could take this apple and I could say, here's an apple. This is one meal, if you like. This is, this is gonna, I could eat this whole apple. 
and that would be the end of it. Or I could take this apple and I could open it and I could take a portion of the apple out and I could sow a portion of the apple in the ground. They're the seeds. And those seeds, once they're sown in the ground and watered, would produce apple trees. And those apple trees, guess what, would produce more apples. And those apples would, produce, would have seeds in them. So I could take those seeds and sow them and they'll produce more apple trees. That's what you call exponential growth. That's what you call abundance. But here's what we often do, myself included sometimes, is we take the whole apple and just eat it. And then say, God, why haven't you provided for me? The feeding of the 5,000, we haven't got time to go there, but the feeding of the 5,000, very famous story. It's in all four Gospels. In the feeding of the 5,000, they had 5,000 hungry men. They had a great need. And the disciples came along and they said, all we have are five loaves and two fish. And they almost cast it aside. You know, in John's Gospel, it says, I think it was Philip, said, what are so few among so many? Like, this isn't going to work. We've got five loaves, two fish, one boy's lunch, 5,000 men. This is not enough. Well, guess what? God provided the seed. He did not provide the harvest. He provided the seed. Now, Jesus said, Jesus took those and looking up. When it says looking up, that means he looked into the spirit realm. He looked beyond the natural. We have to look beyond the natural. You have to realize you don't just live by the natural. You live by the supernatural. So he looked beyond the natural and he saw something that this was seed, not just harvest. Now, think about this. The disciples were hungry too. Twelve disciples and Jesus, they were hungry too. They could have got those loaves and fish and said, hey, we can all snack here. It's been a day. Jesus preached long. Some of you may be thinking this now. It's long, been a long time since we've eaten. We can just eat now. They could have eaten those loaves and fish. They could have just about sustained themselves. And guess what? No abundance. No harvest. Did God provide for them? Yeah. Did God want them to have abundant harvest? Yeah. Why would they have not seen their harvest? Because they ate the seed instead of sowing the seed. Instead of eating that seed, they gave it to Jesus. Jesus took that seed, gave thanks for it. And then sowed that seed, broke it amongst the people, and the people distributed it. And guess what happened? Not only were 5,000 men fed, it was amongst women and children. There could have been 25,000 people there. They were all fed, and they had 12 baskets of leftovers. More than enough. An abundance for every good work. They were able to give those baskets of food away. More than enough. God doesn't just provide enough. He provides more than enough. But he provides in seed form. Then it's up to us whether we're going to, by faith, sow that seed. And here's the other thing they didn't do. They didn't curse the seed. They could have said, the disciples tried it. They said, this isn't enough. Jesus said, give it to me. He gave thanks. He thanked God for that seed, even though in the natural it didn't look like enough. How many times, brothers and sisters, do we have a job opportunity, a small business opportunity, an investment opportunity, something, a bank account, a mountain in the bank account, and we say, this isn't enough, and we just despise it. Zephaniah says, do not despise, or Zachariah says, do not despise small beginnings. We should not despise something small, because that's a seed. Maybe it's a talent, maybe it's an experience, maybe it's, a, it's a, you know, an opportunity you have. Don't despise that small opportunity. Don't despise those little apple seeds. You can have one apple, they say you can count how many seeds in one apple, but you can never count how many apples in one seed. Because as you sow those seeds, they're going to keep reproducing. So what happens is, is we, as money comes to us, however it comes to you, doesn't matter how little it is, remember the widow woman only had two mites. However money comes to you, we're meant to sow a portion of that money. We went to sow a portion of that money. That's what God tells us to do. And when you sow a portion of that money, it increases. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9 lays it out to us real well. Proverbs 3, verse 9. This is how we worship God. We worship God with singing and everything else is great, but also we can worship God this way. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. God wants us to honor him by giving him out of our possessions out of our first fruits out of our increase that means what you have now what you have coming and what's going to keep increasing every time finances come to you or what you have now we're meant to honor God by giving him a portion of that and you know what you think well if I have x amount of money and I give 10 percent or 20 percent away I'm going to have less money no look what happens in verse 10 see God's very nature is a giver God is good God is love and God is generous his very nature, in fact, love, true love is generous. And in 1 John 4, it says God is love. So because God is love, he only operates out of love. That means he only operates out of generosity. That means he doesn't take. He only gives. So if he's asking you to give an offering to him, God's not taking it. What he's doing is he's using that as an opportunity to give you more. So right here he says, um, verse 10, so your barns will be filled with plenty. You give to God. Guess what God's going to do? He's going to fill your barns up with plenty. And your vats are going to overflow with new wine. God's not enough. He's more than enough. He's going to give you more than you need. He's going to, when you trust him with your seed, when you trust him with your first fruits, when you trust him with your possessions, he's going to give you more than enough. More than enough. 
This is how it works. Do you know why I wasn't going to go there, but I'm going to go there. And, and I'm coming into land. I know some of you get nervous, like, hey, what about lunch? I'm coming into land. I know how you think. I think the same thing. <laughs> so, so how many of you know, you know, people say about Cain and Abel, how comes, how comes Cain's offering wasn't accepted? And the dad joke is, is because well, he wasn't able. <laughs> I know it's fun. <sighs> Pastor Ken will be back next week. Don't worry. He's going to be okay. But let me show you something real quickly about, about Cain and Abel. We'll turn to Genesis 4. I want to show you this real quickly. Genesis 4. Um, let's look at verse 3. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, verse 3. So this is Cain and Abel. This is the first tithe, if you like. It's the first time that people gave to God the, the law of first mention. And in verse 3, this is uh, Genesis 4, verse 3. It says, and in the process of time, it, well, let's start in verse uh, 2. Uh, then Eve bore again. And this time she had a, a brother, uh, she had a brother for Cain, Abel. So then she's got Cain and she's got Abel, two sons. And it says, now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, some people say, well, it's the reason why Abel's offering wasn't, Cain's offering wasn't accepted because Cain brought a fruit offering or a vegetable offering and Abel brought a meat offering and God likes blood, God likes a blood offering. That does not make sense. Do you know why? Because God's never going to ask you to give you something you haven't got. <laughs> God's not going to ask you to do something you can't do. God will only ask you to do something you can do. That's why you have the ability to not fear. Because 365 times the Bible tells us, fear not, don't fear, don't be afraid, fear not. He wouldn't tell you to do something if you couldn't do it. So God's not going to tell Cain, you've got to bring a blood offering if he's a farmer of the field, he's a, he's a, you know, he's a, a fruit and veg farmer, or whatever you are, what do you call that, agricultural farmer, and not a, not a meat farmer. All these farmers are like, this guy... This guy from the city does not know what he's talking about. I apologize. You've got your crops, right? Your harvest, your crops, and then you've got your meat, okay? So, so Abel, <laughs> so anyway, they interviewed kids recently, and they said, where does milk come from? They're like, from Walmart. They said, a few of them said Target, but that was it. Like, they didn't know that milk come from cows. But anyway, I'm showing my naivety here. Cain tilled the ground... Abel raised sheep. Okay, that's what we see here. Verse 3. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first fruit of the flock and of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel's offering, but the Lord did not respect Cain's offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Verse 3, it says, and in the process of time. That, ver that word there, process of time, actually means in the end of the days. When, Cain gave, when Abel gave, it says Abel bought the firstborn. Cain waited for all his bills to be paid. He made sure he had enough for himself, and then he gave God the leftovers. It says, in the end of the days, Cain brought an offering to God. In the end of the days. Process of time means the end of the days. When all the bills are paid, when I make sure that I've got, you know, everything's done, I make sure I've got what I need to get, then if I've got something left over, I'll give it to God. Abel gave the firstborn of the sheep. He didn't know if he was going to have a second born or a third born. He just gave the first to God. He gave God the best, the first, the best. That's why Cain's offering wasn't accepted. And that's why Abel's offering was, because he gave God first. He did the Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. He honored the Lord with his first fruit. He honored the Lord of the increase. And I mean to tell you, church, if we do this, if we honor God, this is not works. This is, not something, this is, this is out of faith. It takes faith to do this. When you, when you give to the Lord, when you give a portion of your increase to the Lord, he's going to increase the rest of it supernaturally. I could tell you testimony after testimony about how God has supernaturally increased us when we've trusted him first. I'll tell you one quick story, and then I'm going to pray for you. We, um, we was at church, and the pastor got up and said, we're one mortgage payment away from paying this building off. You'll be there soon, Kent. One mortgage payment away from paying the building off. So he said, we're one mortgage payment away from paying the, bu the, the building off. And I was like, I want to make that last payment. So the pastor came down off the stage, and I said, sir, I said, I want to make the last mortgage payment. He said, you don't have to do that. I said, no, no, I want to do it. This is about 15 years ago. I said, I want to do it. He said, okay, so we'll come and see me tomorrow morning in my office. So I went away, and I was like, I didn't ask him how much it was. <laughs> is this mortgage payment $1,000, or is it like $10,000? I was like, I couldn't sleep, cold sweats. I was like, what have I done? And so I came to his office the next morning. I was like, I bound by my word. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to swear to my own hurt. So I go to his office. And I said, how much is it? He said, the mortgage payment on this, the mortgage monthly payment on this building is $3,300. So I was like, we can do that. Now, it was a big stretch for us to do that, but we could do it. So I got my checkbook out, and I wrote a check for $3,300, and I gave that to pay the church off. 
And as I gave it to the pastor, the pastor took that check and he prophesied over me. He said, actually, he said, because you put God's house first, God is going to give you a house in Colorado Springs and it's going to be worth $330,000. Well, guess what? Because when we gave that money, it was like, well, this is, this is money's gone. You know, it's, it's gone out of our hands. But God doesn't take. He only gives. Even under the law, if you think about it, even under Malachi, the law, if people say, you, you know, uh, uh, you're cursed if you don't give. You're not cursed if you don't give now. The curse has been taken care of. Galatians 3.13, Jesus paid the, taking care of the curse. But even under the Old Testament law, Jesus' purpose for people tithing was to get more to them. It says he's going to open up the windows of heaven and give you such an abundance you can't receive it. So God's purpose is always to give more. It's not to take. So I was giving $3,300, but guess what happened? The, the pastor prophesied over me, God wanted to give me more back. He said, God's going to give you a house, Supernatural in Colorado Springs. I had not got time to go into the Supernatural story. It was a Supernatural story. It was amazing. But it was just a few years later, we owned a house in Colorado Springs, debt-free, no mortgage, worth. And when they evaluated it for the insurance purposes, guess what the valuation came back at? $330,000. God was not trying to take from us. Amen. He was trying to get more to us. I'm telling you, God is trying to get more to you. Now, when, you, when your money comes in, you sow generously, you sow out of that, and God's going to keep increasing it. We started this by talking about generous giving. You can, every one of you could be generous. Every one of you could be generous by giving. And how, you say, how do I know if I'm generous or not? Your flesh will tell you. <laughs> if your giving gets your attention, it's getting heaven's attention. If your giving gets your attention, it means that you're giving generously. And things like tithing, giving 10% of what comes in, that's the training wheels. But even that takes faith, if you think about it. I had a friend who said, Ashley, you cannot be serious. You want me to tithe off all the money that comes in? I said, yeah, I want you to tithe all the money. He said, I can't possibly give that amount of money away every week. And I said, okay, no problem, brother. I'm going to pray for you so that your income goes down to a level where you're comfortable to tithe off of. He went, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, no, no, hang on a minute. I said, because it's exactly the same amount. 10% is 10%. 10% off of 100 is, 10, is the same as 10% off a million. It's the same proportional amount. It's easier to tithe than it is to tip at a restaurant. I mean, that 18 and 20% is tough, but 10% is easy, just move the decimal point. That's the training wheels, tithes and offerings. But it was actually tithing's under the law. Twice, you ain't got time, but twice it was shown. Genesis, 18, Genesis 14, Abraham tithed. To Melchizedek, who was a type and shadow of Jesus, and, and uh, Genesis 28, Jacob tithed. Both before the law, it was a principle that was put in place before the law. You can look at uh, Hebrews 7, read all about that. Jesus is still receiving our tithes. I believe tithes are the training wheels, and then I believe we do tithes and offerings. And right now, I would recommend every one of you, if you're a part of this church and being fed from this church, I would take my increase and my first fruits, and I would be giving it to the church, and also be looking at offerings. Where else can I give? Can I give extra to the building fund? Can I give extra to ministries, traveling ministries? Can I give extra to these missionaries? Can I give extra to these feeding programs? Can I give extra to my neighbors, my benevolence? Tithes and offerings. And when you do that, God is going to increase you supernaturally. When you do that, it takes faith. It's going to get your flesh a bit nervous. We've written checks out before. We've got so nervous. The checks are so, like, you, I have to hold my hand. I'm so nervous. I'm sweating. I watch the bucket. I'm like, it's gone. <laughs> like, I, I wake up in the morning. I'm like, what did I do? You know, you've heard of buyer's remorse. I've had giver's remorse. If you've had giver's remorse. Like, you're not believing God for a harvest. You're like, you're just saying, God, please just give me a refund. I just, I'll just take a refund. <laughs> That's when you know it's a generous offering. And guess what God says? God says who, those who give generously are going to reap generously. I'm here to tell you, church, if you sow generously, God is going to reap generously back to you. And I could tell you testimony after testimony. I'm out of time, but I could give you testimony after testimony how we've reaped generously, sowed generously, and we've reaped generously. And the good news is God has set it up so every single one of us can be generous. Whether we've got two mites or whether we've got a billion dollars, every single one of us can be generous today in Jesus' name. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you've set it up to prosper us, Lord. Your will is for us to prosper. And you set it up, Lord, that every one of us can be generous. Lord, we trust you today. Lord, we repent, myself included, of not trusting you with my finances enough, Lord. We want to go to the next level with you. And Lord, we want our hearts to be with you. And you tell us where our treasure is, there our hearts are also. So right now, Lord, we give you our treasures, we give you our hearts, and we thank you, Lord, that you're not a God who takes. You're a God who gives and gives and gives. You're not a God who decreases. You're a God who increases. And Lord, we thank you for what you did on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for, for experiencing that extreme poverty so that we don't have to have lack anymore. We don't have to have poverty anymore. 
And Lord, I thank you, Lord, in this church, Overcomers Church International, I thank you, Lord, this is a prosperous church. I thank you, Lord, this is a church that is, I thank you, Lord, that this church is a prosperous church, this church is a giving church. I thank you, Lord, this church is a debt-free church, a church that's moving forward, a church that's helping in this, in this community, that's helping in this town, that's helping this state, and that's helping this country. I thank you, this church is a contributing church. I thank you, this church is a prosperous church. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Everyone said amen, amen, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Kent.